lot. Do you know where we hear that a lot in? Sports, um, dance, whatever it may be, uh, theater, music, anything, any activity that we get involved in, we hear those, we hear those words about don't quit, never give up, no pain, no gain. Um, those are themes that I grew up hearing quite a bit in, in my life. And if I think back to, um, to all the times in my life that I've heard about that, it really, there's, there's, one main, there's one main moment where I really got the most out of, where I heard that the most in my life. And that's going to be what we're talking about today, is this no quit, uh, never say die, uh, no pain, no gain, never give up type attitude. But I can remember, um, so I played a lot of uh, sports growing up, but one, one time I, uh, in college, I went to Sac State, and my first year there, I was asked to join the rowing team there. And I'd seen rowing on TV. Basically, the only time you ever see rowing is in the Olympics, right? You, know, you don't really know a whole lot about it or what it is, but somebody had um, approached me that was on the team and said, hey, you should come try out. I'm like, oh, I'll give it a shot. Why not? And I, I miss playing sports, so I went out. And, and did it, and it was, it was fun, but I'll tell you what, uh, it was two and a half hours of practice every single day, 6 to 8.30 in the morning, and it wasn't like, you know, for a half an hour of practice, you sit around and talk and strategize or anything like that. It was like from 6 a.m., you better be there and ready to go, and you're going full board until 8.30 in the morning. Super intense. Every single workout, every single day was incredibly intense. Uh, it's the best shape I've ever been in my life, but many times through that rowing experience, and if you don't know what rowing is, it's the, it's the one where they have the long boat and eight men sit in the boat all in line, and you have the, the four paddles on each side going out, and you paddle 2,000 meters, and that's, that's your race. It's about 1.2 miles. But um, the coaches would stand. He had this little boat, and it was a had, and it, you could stand on it, and he would just be screaming at us as we're practicing, rowing down the, we were at the Lake Natomas Reservoir, and uh, he'd be screaming at us, and in, over and over you hear those words, don't quit, no pain, no gain, don't give up, and it was this, this attitude that was portrayed in us that if you want to be good at this, you have to be nearly perfect. And that was the, that was the mentality that was portrayed to us throughout the entire throughout the entire experience of rowing, is that you have to be nearly perfect. And we got yelled at and screamed at. I don't even know why. Like I didn't, it's not like I was on a scholarship or anything. You know, I just, it was a club sport, so you just went out and tried out. And man, I, mean, I could have I quit at any time. But like that, that constant berating of don't quit, don't quit, you know, you just, there's something inside you that, that this drive kind of kicks in and you're just like, I want to succeed in this. Um, but it was... What was, what's interesting about the sport of rowing is it's, it's a beautiful sport. Um, you don't say that a lot about sports, but if you've ever watched it on the Olympics to see everybody in sync, you know, when, they, when the oar goes in the water and then and it pulls back and then it pops up and then it, you know, goes parallel with the water. It's called feathering the oar. And then it comes back and then it drops and goes back in the water. And it has to all be in perfect sync. And I think that's why they give us this, this don't quit, this never give up, this perfection type mentality because of one person in the boat messes up on just one stroke, you, will, you can ruin the entire race for the rest of the boat. Uh, you know, I think about how it doesn't compare to a lot of other sports is that uh, you, know, you mess up in basketball, you have a turnover, well, you have the entire game to recover. Uh, in football, you fumble, you have the game to recover. That, might, that one play may not make or break a game, but one mistake with the oar in rowing can make or break the entire race. And it was, uh, it was incredibly difficult because they, the one thing you never wanted to do was called catching a crab. And it was when the oar's coming back, if you didn't have it perfectly level, because the oar's only about this much above the water, about six to eight inches. Um, and if the boat rocks a little bit as you're going. So if it's not level and you, it's called catching a crab, when you bring the oar back, when you're flowing the water, the oar will kick and it'll, it'll hit you in the chest. And if it happens hard enough, which never happened to me luckily, but it, I did see it happen at, at a few events that we went to and in invites, that um, if it hit you hard enough, you caught a crab hard enough, the oar would kick back into your chest and it would knock you completely out of the boat. And then you're disqualified. And, but it was incredibly, uh, like I said, this sport was incredibly difficult. It was the time of my life where I realized and understood that this never give up type attitude never meant more than during that time. And so it's, it's an interesting story because when I was thinking about the sermon today 
and thinking about this mentality of don't quit, this mentality of never give up when it comes to our Christian life, the first thing that came to mind was this experience at Sac State uh, being on the rowing team. So how does, that, how does that relate to us as Christians? How does this mentality relate to us as Christians? Uh, we don't have to be perfect, luckily, you know, like, like we do in that sport. We, we all make mistakes, right? We can make mistakes, and we absolutely will make mistakes in our Christian life, and that's okay. So that's, um, that's what's different. But what's the same is the mentality as a Christian to never give up. This mentality that we have as a Christian to never give up, to not quit. And it's a, it's a hard one to grasp sometimes because of all of the things that come up in our life on a constant basis. And we're going to talk about a few of the things as we go through. But when I say don't quit and never give up, I don't mean just as a Christian. I'm not talking about just that I am a, I am a Christian and I'm never going to give up being a Christian. It's a lot more than that. When we go, when we talk about this theme of never giving up, of never quitting, we're talking mainly about this theme about being a servant of Christ. And I really do think there's a big difference, maybe you'll agree, in, in saying I'm a Christian and, and saying I'm a servant of Christ. Now essentially, if you call yourself a Christian, that should mean that you're a servant of Christ because a Christian is a follower of Christ by definition. And if we are a follower of Christ, then we should be trying to follow everything that he teaches in here. But I think it's, it's safe to make the assumption that if we use the, how we use the word today, calling yourself a Christian and calling yourself a servant of Christ are two pretty different things, right? It, it, not, in, not in denotation and dictionary definition, but in connotation. Today, they're two different things. So I want to turn to uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. We're going to be in a few different verses today, not necessarily just one passage. But Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, this is one of those verses that, um, that just brings so much truth to, to living and being a servant of Christ. And it's not always one that's, that's the easiest to follow. So Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 it says, let us not become weary in doing good for the people, for at the, um, sorry, for at the proper time we will reap the harvest if we do not give up. This scripture saying, let us, and other, other versions say, don't ever get tired of doing what is good. Don't ever get tired of doing what is good. When we think about that scripture that was written in Galatians chapter 6, um, you obviously have to think about Paul just a little bit, the Apostle Paul, because not just what we see in Galatians, but also i um, been doing a study through Acts recently, and we've been teaching it to the youth group, and it's a, man, I haven't studied Acts in, like really deeply in, a, in quite a while, and what a phenomenal study Acts is. I, I encourage you, if you haven't done that in quite a few years, to go back and reread Acts and not just read it, but really dive into it and study it and understand what's going on there because, um, and understand how Acts ties in to all of the different letters that we read in the Bible and how they all play together. And that as you read through Acts, you're seeing that what was going on in Acts is the exact same time as, as Paul writing some of his letters, um, some of his letters in the New Testament. But in when we, when we talk about Paul and we say how this verse is him because it relates to him because it's him who wrote it, uh, we know that he wrote Galatian to the churches in the Galatia region. All right, it wasn't to a city, it was to a region. And most people think that the, Galatian, the Galatia region had about four different churches that it was written to. And uh, that this book of Galatians was passed around to those four different churches. And a lot of people think, and I know there's some debate out there, but most people believe that he wrote Galatians during his second missionary trip, all right? During his second missionary trip because he had visited the region of Galatia on his first. He actually visited on all three of his missionary trips, but on the second one is when he wrote it after visiting there the first time and setting up the churches there. So... There's a lot going on in that region. That region is a very Hellenistic region and a lot of different viewpoints going on in, in that area. But what Paul does is he comes out and he says to them towards the very end of his book that was passed around to these four different churches, don't ever get tired 
of doing what is right. If we read this verse, we got to understand we got to understand what it's saying. I, I truly believe that Paul was the type of person that had a don't quit, that had a never give up attitude. You know, Paul's ministry lasted about 30 years. From the time that he was converted, when Saul became Paul, until the time that he was, um, that he was killed and martyred. And he went through a lot in his life. We know, we know what Paul what Paul had to go through. We know how much persecution that he had to face. We know how uh, much hardships that he had in his life. But we know also that we read that he says, and not just here, there's other verses that talk about it, that he had this attitude of, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not ever going to get tired of doing what is good. So tells us in 2 Timothy, you can turn over to chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. It says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Listen to that again. Everyone who wants to live a Christian life or a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Verse 13, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you... Continue in what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from what you have learned and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures would have been able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. This is another very quoted, uh, highly quoted verse here, verse 16. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that men, so that the men of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we see again in 2 Timothy now, we're seeing this, this mantra, this example of what Paul is trying to say, saying, guys, please don't stop doing what is good. Please don't get tired of that. Um, it tells us in verse 12 that we will be persecuted. And I think it's safe to say, and I know this kind of goes a little bit out on a limb here, um, but I think you can make this conclusion from this verse that if you're living a lifestyle and you're not being persecuted in any way in your life, then maybe you're not living out your faith enough. That if you aren't being persecuted in any way in your life by anybody for the faith that you have in Jesus Christ, then maybe you truly aren't living out your faith. Because he tells us that everybody who lives a godly life will be persecuted will be persecuted. Uh, what does that persecution look like? Maybe it's we're made fun of. Maybe it's that we're told we're ignorant. Maybe we're told we're closed-minded. Maybe we're told we're uneducated, um, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we can go on and say all the ways that we as Christians in today's day and age in America can be persecuted. Uh, we can be told that what we believe is no longer um, of value. We can be told that it's very old-fashioned. We can be told that it's too traditional and we need to get with the times and get with the new culture and start thinking a different way. Um, and it almost kind of, like I said, you know, like I preached about before, being shoved down our throats in a way in today's culture. But we have to be willing to make a stand in our faith in Jesus Christ and never get tired of doing what is good. We have a lot of distractions as well. We get tired. Anybody tired? I'm tired today too. <laughs> In class today, all the kids are just kind of sitting around, kind of tired too. I think if I didn't talk, they would all fall asleep. Um, I think we get busy. Anybody feel busy? I think one of Satan's greatest things that he puts in our life is busyness, is he wants us to feel busy. He wants us and our schedules to be so full and so packed that we don't have time to serve God. We don't have time to serve Christ because we have all these other things that we need to do. And I'll tell you what, that's a big struggle of mine. Ask my wife, she'll attest very clearly that I, I'm go, 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 and say yes to everything and fill my schedule so full that I can't do anything anymore. It's a, it's a struggle of mine, it always has been, and she's always kind of um, calling me out on it, which is a good thing because I think that Satan loves it when we're busy. I think that he wants us to be busy because it doesn't give us time to be a servant of Christ and to never get tired. It allows us to get tired of doing what is good. It's really easy to start saying uh, in, in this that 
I just, I'm too busy to go to church. I'm too busy to be at youth group. I'm too busy to go to Sunday school class on Sunday mornings at nine because I'm too tired, because I had a long week at work. It's really easy to just sleep in. It's easy to just show up to church at 10 o'clock and to not be there for class. That's the easy way because when we get busy, we start to get tired, we start to feel overrun, and then we don't want to be here because we got too many other things. I'm not saying that's everybody, but we got too many things that get in our way. And I think we need to be careful of that. Satan wants us to feel busy because when we're busy, we get wore out. And when we get wore out and overwhelmed, it's really easy to get lazy and get complacent in our life when it comes to being a servant of Christ. And it's really easy to not be as involved in church anymore. We see it happen all the time. Have you guys seen it happen? Have you seen it happen for you? I've seen it happen for me. Anybody else felt burned out at church before? <laughs> you don't want to admit it. You're like, no, not me. But yeah, in my head, I kind of am. I felt burned out multiple times. I think that that, that happens. Um, but we need to be sure and we need to be careful and we need to be willing to know, know that about ourselves and recognize when that happens so that we can continually fill ourselves up. All right? We need that. But the Bible also tells us that blessed is the man that comes to serve and not be served. This mentality that Paul has across the board of never getting tired of doing what is good. How he did what he did in his 30 years of ministry sometimes just baffles my mind. How he was able to never stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ sometimes just baffles me. You see through all of his writing, he warns us of this. He says in the midst of heartache, in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of sickness, maybe of a job change, maybe the birth of a child, raising a family, uh, school, homework, so many other things that try to pull us away from putting God first. So what is it that you have in your life right now that is pulling you away from putting God first? A little bit of self-reflection time. In Acts 28, verse 31, you can flip over there. It's the very, very end. It's the very last verse in Acts. And this is the very, it's not the last thing that Paul did. It's not the last thing that, that was written about Paul. It's just the last thing that's recorded in Acts. In fact, during his, it, we only read about his three, as you're turning there, we only read about his three missionary trips in Acts. He had a fourth one that's talked about in Titus and in Timothy. Um, but in Acts chapter 28, Verse 31, it says, Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Boldly and without hindrance. Is this convicting? Because it is to me. When I read that Paul boldly and without hindrance preached the kingdom of God that was taught about the Lord Jesus Christ, it convicts me. Paul believed so deeply he believed so deeply in the gospel of Jesus Christ that he never quit and he was never hindered in his ministry to God. He never quit. He never stepped down. He never took a break. He never said, I'm just going to pull back right now and not be a servant at, you know, for God. He never said, I just, I just need, to, I need to not serve right now. I need to do some other things. He never said that. It says he boldly and without hindrance, continually, his entire time in ministry for 30 years, never quit preaching the kingdom of God. And we wonder, we wonder, how did Paul do this? How did Paul do this? I think there's a very easy explanation to how he did it. I think he did it with the Holy Spirit. Amen? He did it with the Holy Spirit with the empowering of the Holy Spirit. and tells us in Acts chapter 9, verse 17, that's the first time Paul was converted. In fact, we just read about that in, in, our, in our class today, about Paul, about what he was saw at the time, about his conversion. And it says that Ananias came and laid hands on him and filled him with the Holy Spirit. So at that moment, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit happened for Paul. All right? There's a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference there. 
If you study the Greek words, there's a difference there that we read about in the Old Testament. A lot of times we see, and I remember used to being confused about this, we know somebody had the Holy Spirit, but then later on in their ministry, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. As I talked, I'm like, filled, wait a minute, did they just get the Holy Spirit again because they already had the Holy Spirit? No, that's not what the verse is actually saying. What it's saying is, yes, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, but now they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. All right, have you ever felt empowered by the Holy Spirit? It's an incredible feeling. It's an incredible feeling. So it tells us in Acts 13, 9 that he was, it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit to continue in his ministry. At that moment, we know that he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. All right, and then in Acts 19, verse 2, it tells us that he gave and he had the ability to give the Holy Spirit to other people, to help other people have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what made possible for Paul to have the never quit, never give up attitude. Everything that happens for us in our life today is because of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Everything. Everything that we do, every gift we have, everything that we do for Jesus Christ, for God, for the kingdom of God, preaching the good news, it tells us very, very clearly in Acts chapters 1 through 2 and 3 that, uh, that it is the Holy Spirit that provides us that power, that empowers us to do that work. He gives us the power. The Holy Spirit gives us the power. He gives us the drive, the will, the fight, the passion, the commitment, the dedication. I'm going to keep saying some more words, but listen for a word that resonates with you when it comes to the Holy Spirit. He gives us the strength, the tenacity, the discipline, the fortitude, the desire, the ability, the capacity, the influence, the authority. Have you heard a word that resonates with you yet when it comes to the Holy Spirit? He gives us the command, the leverage, the pressure, the esteem, the intensity, the energy, the vigor, the might, the potency, the force, and the effectiveness to never quit preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to everybody that we come in contact with. Hopefully one of those words said, yeah, that's me. That's the word that I see when it comes to me and the Holy Spirit. There's a list of about 25 words there. And I hope that you have seen that in your life. It tells us, in, if you go all the way back, so we ended with, we were just talking about Acts 28, but if you go all the way back to the beginning in Acts chapter 1, that's where we read about the ascension of Jesus Christ. And in the ascension of Jesus Christ, it says that the disciples were standing there. This isn't Paul now because he wasn't in the picture yet. But in the ascension of Jesus Christ, it says that the disciples were just standing there staring up at heaven, staring up. And Jesus looks down at them and he says, what are you guys doing? Like, why are you staring at me? My work here is done. It's time for you to go back and don't start your ministry yet because you're not ready. But go back and wait and I'm going to give you the power to move forward in your ministry. And the power that he was talking about is the Holy Spirit. And that comes to them in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. So he says, don't start your ministry yet. You're not ready. You can't do your ministry yet. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to get that ministry going. And so he tells them to go back to Jerusalem. They go back, they wait, they're meeting in the room, and that's when the day of Pentecost happens. That's when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. They now have the indwelling, and then just very, a short time later, they get the empowerment to go and to preach the good news to all of the world. And that message that was given to them 2,000 years ago, that mission is the exact same mission that we now have today. We still have that same mission, if we call ourselves a Christian, if we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we still have the mission to go out into the world and preach the gospel. Amen? That has not died. That has not ended. That hasn't quit. It is our responsibility to do that. It doesn't mean that, oh, I don't, I don't have the spiritual gift of, of um, evangelism. I don't have the spiritual gift of teaching. You know, well, sure, those spiritual gifts are there, but I think through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability, every single one of us sitting in this room right now, to talk to people about Jesus Christ. Just because it does, I don't feel like that's my spiritual gift and mine is to serve, so all I'm going to do is sit back and just serve and let people come to me, I think we're missing the point of the Holy Spirit. I think the point of the Holy Spirit is calling us to go out 
and to preach the good news to everybody we come in contact with. That's what he wants us to do. That's what he empowers us to do. And we need to be really careful that we don't sit back. I was in studying Acts. Uh, one of the things I came across, which I thought was a fantastic uh, line, it was really, really convicting to me, and it said, what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit being inside you if you're not doing anything with him? What's the point of getting baptized? And we know in Acts 2 that it says, if you didn't have the Holy Spirit yet, when you get baptized, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It tells us that in 2.38, but now that you've been baptized, if you have the Holy Spirit living inside you and you're not doing anything with it, then what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit being inside you? Because his purpose is to now indwell in us after Jesus leaves and his time on earth is gone, his purpose is to dwell in us and to continue to spread the word of God through us. Not just through the people who have the gift of evangelism or teaching, but through all of us. That is his purpose church, and that's what we are supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. As we wrap things up today, um, I want you to understand that he helps us to focus. He helps us in our focus, on our focus to remain on God and not to remain on men. The last verse I'm going to read for today is, is Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. And you can flip over there if you'd like. I lost my spot, sorry. All right, Galatians chapter one, verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. If I'm still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. It's kind of one of those other verses that's, that's quite convicting as well. We're not supposed to care what people think, right? But do we all care what people think? Absolutely. I know I do. Generally speaking, a lot of times that's what stops us from, from putting the good news out there. That's what stops us from talking to people. It's a struggle of mine as well. I could tell you I've been at pg e for 10 years and there's somebody there, there's a few, quite a few people there that they know I'm a Christian, they know I do ministry at church, but I've never preached the good news to them. 10 years I've been there and I've never preached the good news to them. I've never talked to them about Jesus Christ. And it says that we're not supposed to care about what men think, about what people think. We're only supposed to care about what God thinks. And I can tell you right now that if I didn't care at all, what anybody at work thought of me, if I didn't care at all about any of that, about people, then I promise you I would have already talked to them about Jesus Christ. But I do care. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's a struggle of mine. So I don't want you to think that I'm up here saying, everybody go talk to everybody. It's really easy because it's not always easy. We care what people think. But it says, Paul is telling us, if I care what people think, then I'm not truly a servant of God. Because if you're truly a servant of God and you truly allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, then you're going to care less what anybody thinks of you. You're just going to be out there talking to anybody you come in contact with about the good news. That doesn't mean you have to be one of those, those people that just walk up and start saying, do you know Jesus? You know, because sometimes that can get a little bit awkward. But I think through relationship and through life experience and keeping our eyes open to opportunities to put in a good word for God, those come all the time in our life. And are we taking every opportunity that we have to talk to people about the good news of Jesus Christ? Paul didn't care. He knew, hands down, full board, with everything in him, what he experienced. He knew Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He knew and felt the indwelling and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And he knew that the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to put the gospel message out there, is to preach the good news to people that he came in contact with. And he would not be hindered. He boldly spoke without hindrance about the kingdom of God. He knew the power of God. That gave him that don't quit, never give up attitude. And I think we can all have it. 
It's just up to us to choose if we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us or not. It's really a decision that each of us makes every single day of our lives. Look around. I see a lot of empty pews today. Just look to your left and your right. Do you see, do you notice that there, do you notice people that aren't here? Can you think of them? If you look around, can you say, oh yeah, I don't see so-and-so that I usually see here. Maybe can you think of someone if you're looking around seeing some empty pews that maybe you haven't seen in two or three weeks, four weeks? I challenge you to reach out to those people this week. Because I think the last thing that we want is a church that dwindles because we as a church aren't reaching out to the very people that we're supposed to be reaching out to. It's our responsibility as a church, not just as an eldership or a deaconship or, or a staff to reach out to the people that aren't here it calls us all to be ministers. And the way that we do that is through the Holy Spirit. So look around you. If you see somebody that you know is usually here and they're not here, I challenge you to reach out to them this week. Make that the one easy way that I'm going to start following and listening to the Holy Spirit in my life. Make that the one easy way that we say, I'm not just going to make it about me and about my study, but I'm going to make it about other people. Because I don't care what people think. I don't care if they think that I'm pounding them and, and hounding them and calling them on a week out and week out basis, trying to encourage them to be at church and be a part of our family. I don't care what they think because I understand and I know the importance of this message. I know how important, how crucial this is in life. If you know people that are hurting sitting around you, who cares what they think? Reach out to them. That is our purpose as Christians, is to reach out to people that are hurting. It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what God thinks. And it is our job as Christians to do that, to reach out to people, to try to come alongside people and walk with people through all aspects of life, whether it's heartache or whether it's victory. We walk through them through all aspects of life. So I challenge you the way that I'm challenged, the way that Paul challenged all of us to preach the gospel, to preach it boldly, to preach it without hindrance, and to do so in a way that you have an attitude of never quitting and never giving up and never ever getting tired of doing what is good in your life. Let's stand and sing. Holy Lord, most holy.